Another coup in West Africa. Soldiers in Niger have seized power and removed the democratically elected president. What does it mean for the fight against armed groups in the Sahel? And how do recurrent military takeovers cripple democracy in Africa? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Sahil Rahman. Niger's president, Mohamed Bazoum, was elected two years ago in the first peaceful democratic transfer of power since independence in 1960. But on Wednesday, members of his own presidential guard removed him from office. The coup leaders say they want to prevent further economic and security problems. Niger's neighbours, Mali and Burkina Faso, have seen four military takeovers since 2020. So what does this mean? for Western countries who have increasingly relied on Niger as a base of operations against armed groups in the Sahel. And with the Wagner Group mercenaries already active in several African nations, will these developments increase Russia's influence on the continent? We'll be discussing all of this in a few moments with our guests, but first, this report from Victoria Gatenby. Soldiers surround Niger's national television station in the capital, Niamey as well as the residence of President Mohamed Bazoum. Hours later, they announced the president's removal. We, the Security Defence Forces, gathered at the National Council for the Safeguard of the Homeland, have decided to put an end to the regime you know. This follows the continuous deterioration of the security situation and poor social and economic management. The United Nations, African Union, Regional Bloc, ECOWAS and the United States have all demanded Bazoum's reinstatement. The United States resolutely supports him as the democratically elected president of Niger. We call for his immediate release. We condemn any effort to seize power by force. Bazoum's inauguration two years ago was the first peaceful transfer of power between democratically elected leaders since the country gained independence from France in 1960. When Al Jazeera spoke to Bazoum last year, he was optimistic about the future. I think the difficulties are behind us. We succeeded in a democratic change of power. I symbolize a hope, simply a hope for the end of the ethnic issues and the relationship to power. Niger is one of the world's poorest nations. For decades, it's struggled with drought and food shortages, which has led to unrest and ethnic conflict. But more recently, Niger has faced another challenge, the rise of armed groups and an increase in attacks in the Sahel region. Frustrations about the worsening insecurity has been a driving force for coups. Neighboring Mali and Burkina Faso have seen four military takeovers in the past three years. I think there's a real question that Washington has to be asking itself right now. If after all of this money and attention and engagement and assistance, if we cannot keep Niger on a democratic path, then what are we doing wrong? Since Mali and Burkina Faso ordered foreign troops to leave last year, France and the U.S. have increasingly relied on Niger as a base of operations against ISIL and Al-Qaeda affiliates. Russian mercenaries are also active in the Sahel. The consequences of the coup will be felt far beyond Niger's borders, raising doubts about the resilience of democratic governments in a region plagued by instability. Victoria Gatenby for Inside Story. Well, for more on this, I'm joined now in the Nigerian capital of Abuja is Kabir Adamu, the managing director of Beacon Consulting, a security risk management and intelligence firm that operates in the Sahel. In Paris is Nicolas Norbrook, the managing editor of the Africa Report magazine, which covers pan-African politics and business. And in London, Alex Vines, director of the Africa program at Chatham House. A warm welcome to all of my guests. Thanks for joining us here on Inside Story. Uh, Kabir Adamu, can I come to you first in Abuja? Um, Niger is not the first, and I doubt it's not going to be the last country to experience a coup in the region. They happen pretty often. But what's going wrong here? Thank you. Um, so uh, what the coup plotters have, have announced as their reasons, um, they've, they've mentioned two things, um, security and the economy. Um, however, the reality uh, of what we see in both Niger and other countries is that um, when the military take over, 
they are not able to address these two issues. Um, in terms of what is actually happening on ground, sadly, the Sahel region and most parts of West Africa are uh, being af afflicted by different um, threat elements, especially the influence of non-state armed groups that are ideologically based. So in particular, there are several um, ideological groups that are affiliated with the global um, terrorist groups, um, yeah. IS, Islamic State, that of Al-Qaeda. And Niger is not, um, you know, spared out. It it's also has its own share of um, influence of, of these groups. So to an extent, yes, security is a challenge. Um, and then, of course, the economy too. Uh, the influence, what happened after COVID-19, and then, of course, the impact of um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine are sure. being felt by countries in the Sahel and West Africa. So all of these are realities. But sadly, the claim that the military will be in a better position to address that has not been factual. Indeed, we'll delve into that uh, as we continue with the conversation. Nicholas Norbrook uh, in Paris, let's just start with the initial rumours uh, of the appointment of a, a new presidential guard, which seems to have been the flashpoint for uh, the coup or the rebellion, however we want to describe it. It seems to have spread much wider to the, the military to a full-blown coup. Is that a fair assessment that this was simmering all the time or it has come as a complete shock? I think it came as a shock to President Badoum. Even uh, last night, he was sending us text messages saying um, the other elements of the army will be here soon. It's just the presidential guard which is involved uh, in this coup. Um, so I think he and uh, a lot of other people are fairly surprised uh, at the widespread nature of it. We understand um, elements of the police are involved as well as um, most of the army, and of course, this presidential guard, which ironically has had a great deal of adventure, uh, rather a great deal of investment put into it over the last few decades to try and uh, stave off uh, the coup attempts, which uh, have plagued Niger since uh, it gained its independence yeah. in the 60s. So uh, let's cross over to Alex Vines and I will develop that because obviously, you know, it, it's interesting, isn't it? You invest so much in your military and in your security because you are a, a big player uh, in the region to try and not just defend your own country, but your borders. And that very group of people, Alex, turn on you. Uh, are you surprised at the way things have happened so very quickly? No, we, we, we've seen a pattern here. So um, you're absolutely right. One of the problems in the Sahelian area is that there's been a lot of investment in, in security. Uh, and so building up um, presidential guards, I mean, you can call them Praetorian guards. The, the presidential guard in Niger is 2,000 strong. Uh, and so the, the, the unintended consequence is that uh, the one institution that, that is well-resourced uh, and is, is better trained is, is the military and particularly the, the kind of elite units. And, and the unattended consequences is that, that you, you turn fragile straits into brittle ones uh, and you, you start to get uh, uh, a very frustrated uh, broader population and interest groups encouraging the military to stage a coup. Now, you know, they, they all claim they're for peace, security, fair play, justice and equity. But what we're also seeing, and there's a very good UNDP report that was launched two weeks ago that interviewed 8,000 people across these countries like Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, where there's been coups, um, on, on what people actually want ultimately. And it is about a better economy. It's about better security. The only good news is that the, the end goal is better democracy. Mm. Uh, uh, but the interviews show a lot of buyer's remorse because... Uh, as your previous speaker said, the, the, the military is just not equipped to, to pr provide, you know, better security long term uh, and certainly not democracy. Yeah, well, let's, we'll talk about security and democracy and certainly finances just a little bit later. One more question to Kabir uh, Adamu about sort of the current situation, the swiftness of the coup. I mean, you heard Alex there saying he wasn't surprised from, from the analysis that Chatham House has. From where you are in Abuja and in West Africa. Uh, is Nigeria surprised by what's going on? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, given the statement by the president, who is the current um, chairman of ECOWAS, uh, immediately after the news emerged, he issued a statement. He followed that by sending out a delegation. So, yeah, it, it appears he is surprised. And, um, I mean, there, there is discussion 
also around what has been described as the colossal failure of intelligence. Um, uh, I mean, those uh, put in the forward talked about Sudan, how um, Sudan happened, and it appears the intelligence um, capabilities of not just African countries, but Western countries too, were either unaware or were caught off guard. So the same thing with this development in Niger. It appears that, um, you know, the state institutions um, and the debate or channels that the, the intelligence platforms represent were pr probably not um, aware or not ready for such, such a development. And that's why we saw um, a, a visit from an ECO, fellow ECOWAS, um, you know, leader, to the Nigerian president, and then the result of that was the delegation. But more significantly was the inability of the delegation that was sent by the president to prevent the total collapse of the government in Niger. And more importantly, to also secure the release of um, the uh, elected president, of because uh, as it were, he's still in detention at the moment. So yeah, um, it appears the, the Nigerian state and, and the ECOWAS chair, because of course it's the, president, the Nigerian president that is occupying that, where to, uh, to, unaware of that of the development in Niger. Sure. And Nicholas, uh, let's go back to you in Paris. I mean, you know, corruption, greed, the temptation of absolute power, uh, and the phrase absolute power corrupts. I mean, what is it? What is it that attracts the military to think they can do a better job than, than democratically elected officials, be they good or bad? They are still democratically elected by the people. It's it's a uh, it's a tough one. I, just to pick up on on a previous point and on the failure of intelligence, it's it's all the more surprising when the man who's believed to be behind this putsch, uh, General Abdurrahman Chiani, who is the head of this Praetorian Guard, Presidential Guard that we've been speaking about, um, he he's known about. He's a, he's a known quantity, and when. Um, President Bazoum's successor, Isufu, handed, was about to hand over the, the, the presidential chair. Um, two days before the inauguration, there was an attack on the presidency. And there were rumors that this um, General Chiani was behind it then, rumors which have never really been dispelled. Um, so it is, it is surprising that Niger intelligence, that um, partner intelligence agencies have not been able to, to catch it. Um, in, in terms of you know what, what these um, military uh, elites believe they're they're doing, it's it's very hard to tell. But it it, it does seem that they're the the consequences for their actions uh, are not really being felt, or at least they they don't feel much deterrence either from um, Western partners who have poured in a lot of cash, and there was a visit in February, I believe, by UK Minister for Africa. There was a visit by uh, Anthony Blinken, US Secretary of State, in March. Uh, in April, the, the German Defence Minister was there. So there's been an incredible amount of uh, money poured into the military, but no, no deterrence felt from there. And no deterrence felt from the, re from the region. There was a time when Nigeria was considered the gendarme of, of West Africa. Um, that, that's no longer the case, clearly. No, it isn't. I mean, uh, Alex Vines, uh, as, as you analyse uh, the way we've seen so many coups in that region in, in, in the last, you know, four to five years, you know, we think of Mali, we think of Burkina Faso. I mean, where do groups like ECOWAS and the African Union stand in, in sort of trying to encourage nation building? Yes, they may be focused on the economy, they may be focused as groups that deal with the politique of countries, but they also have a responsibility to maintain that level of uh, hope of democracy, don't they? Hope of bringing countries forward post-colonial periods. Yeah, so it, it's definitely a concern. As you mentioned, since 2020, we've had seven coups and three attempted coups. That Those are really confirmed ones and, and maybe a bunch of others. Uh, I, I would kind of say that ECOWAS is trying, you know, we've got a new Tanubu administration, so a new Nigerian president who has a vision for the region, cares about his near abroad is looking at how he rebuilds the regional economic community. I was in Abuja myself only a couple of weeks ago. There was a summit about these particular issues. They were really concerned about Niger in particular, as well as Burkina Faso and what to do with Mali. So I wouldn't say there's been a complete intelligence uh, failure here. There were concerns 
around elite disputes inside Niger, particularly between the current president, uh, President Bazoum, and his predecessor, President Usufu, who was uh, much more closely aligned with General Omar Chiani. I'm not sure I agree that Chiani was involved in the, the attempt of the March 2021 coup. I think he actually stopped it. So, so um, the, 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 you know, going forward, it's about how can the economic community of West African states become more effective, more efficient, and really not just be condemning coups but with, with, with words, but actually with actions. And I think that's, that's, you know, that's what's been drawn out really urgently now uh, with Niger, because Niger is not just strategic and important for the West, uh, it's equally important for Nigeria. And, and so uh, a lot of focus is now being put on to how to convince the putschists to, mm. to, to back down, basically. That's what's going on right at the moment. Uh, Kabir Adamu in Abuja, um, the modus operandi, certainly, uh, of the situation seems to reflect what we've seen in the region. I'll ask Nicholas the same sort of uh, the answer to this question as well, but I'll start with you, Kabir, first. It starts off, and I'm just going to quickly, briefly summarise it. Military takeover, borders close. Military officers address the nation. Regional bodies like the AU condemn the coup. Sanctions are put in place, delegations sent in to talk, delegations free the president, who goes into exile. Military remain in uh, power, promise elections that never really happen openly. Regional bodies lift sanctions, Western countries that condemn the action, restore diplomatic and economic relations, the end. It seems to be going partly to script. Exactly, and I, and I think this is just to relate it to your earlier question on what kind of the incentive for these military officers to take over government. Sadly, we haven't seen any consequences in almost uh, all the six, um, you know, uh, coups that have happened from 2020 till date. We haven't seen any direct consequences on the. Uh, and Nicholas, can I bring you in here in Paris? I mean, you were smiling at what I had to say, but I think that's the reality, isn't it? This is what we've seen repeated again and again. Alex is also nodding in agreement, so I think we're all on the same page here. Absolutely. It, 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 the script you outlined um, is eerily accurate, um, and I, I don't know if there's a, any shortcuts to it. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't remove agency, though, from um, those delegations. and. You know, I absolutely take the point that the, the Tinubu administration may have much more force than the Buhari administration, uh, which ran Nigeria for the previous eight years, had. But but certainly when President Basanjo was in charge uh, and Nigeria was very comfortable projecting military force in the region, that script wasn't really adhered to, and and sometimes uh, coup plotters found themselves taste violently out of office, um, which, you know, while you can't, you know, uh, allow violence of any sort, um, that kind of um, sense of there, there might be retribution, you know, did carry mm. a certain kind of, kind of weight in the region for, for a few years. So we can only hope that we will see a different script emerge and that local actors, don't forget, Nigeria is two-thirds of the economy of West Africa. It is a, a serious player. Yeah. Um, and if Nigeria's foreign policy became, becomes much more muscular, I think maybe that script can be flipped. Yeah. Uh, Alex, you were nodding in agreement as well through that. The big difference, that uh, you've got a lot more ambition, that, that basically the new Nigerian foreign policy of Tanubu that's being drawn up at the moment is a, is a robust response against putschists. There's one thing that Tanubu and the incoming officials that are beginning to emerge around him that or, or that they have common vision, and that's they don't like military dictatorships. They all learnt their craft when, when uh, they're dealing with opposing the Abacha administration in, in in Nigeria. So this is a very different Nigeria, and I think this is where the putschists in in Niamey may have miscalculated. The big neighbour next door is going to be a lot more proactive and a, more, a lot more influential than, than, than Western partners, be they France, EU or, 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 or the United States. If we look at the region itself and the countries that surround um, Niger, um, Bazoum took power, uh, what, two years ago, um, uh, and with military, crew, military coups happening ar around the region, the fallout of uh, Libya's civil war, 
uh, coups in Mali and Burkina Faso, even, even Chad, very unstable. These were all external security challenges that his country had to deal with. But there were ev internal ones too, but were they that evident? Nicholas. Um, I, I, it's hard to, to see whether they had got to that kind of um, level. The, the handover between Isufu and Bazoum was held up at the time as being uh, a real breakthrough for the region. Um, at the time, there was a lot of attempts to rewrite constitutions in many Sahel countries to allow a third term for presidential uh, people in the presidency. Um, and Niger's uh, Isufu said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go on forever. I've had my two terms. I'm even going to designate who I would like uh, in my party to succeed me, my defense minister, uh, Bazoum. Um, and so when that handover went over relatively uh, well, a lot of people were, were, were pretty, in, pretty heartened for the region. I'll tell you something else which happened in 2021. Just very and quickly. that was the death. Sorry, the death of President Idris Deby, who yeah. had been the France's gendarme for security in the region, doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Niger was the only one today, since uh, that has turned in on itself, Niger is the only one doing that role. So now there are a few question marks. Kabir, let's uh, bring you back in here from Abuja. Let's talk about security and move the conversation on now. We've got a good sense of what's going on in Niger. Um, we, we're seeing Western forces being pulled out uh, of, of countries, security partners in Mali, for example. The US is, might, you might even say, on the back foot. So is France dealing with uh, the insurgencies across the Sahel and trying to help its African friends. We're seeing Russia come in as an alternative to the failures of various military operations. How do you assess the situation right now? now in terms of the importance of Niger, where the US and France do have troops? So um, the geopolitics of, um, I mean, the Western nations is playing out in Africa uh, in, in very clear terms. Um, and sadly, we're seeing both state institutions and non-state actors. Uh, Wagner has been mentioned severally. And even in the Nigerian coup, um, there has been suggestion that there are actors at play that may be affiliated with some of these countries. And um, if, if I'm going to give a prognosis, this, this is likely to be the scenario over the next few years. Um, there has also been suggestion that perhaps because of the attention of the the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that type of um, you know interest has dwindled um, from a geostrategic point in, in in Africa, especially the Sahel region, where the two uh, global um, um, uh, terrorist hmm. um, uh, you know um, aff affiliates have been growing. That's IS and, and Al Qaeda, and so it, it's this type of in, in, in impact and consequence on security that we're seeing over time. But at the top of all of this, the umbrella that ties all of this is good governance and it's um, lack of it within, within the region. Um, so much has happened institutionally and structurally that has a, a allowed um, this type of development that, that leads to coup. And I think sadly, both the multilateral, regional, and global institutions, ECO, we've discussed ECO as um, AU as well, do not speak enough around good governance. The, 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 the lack of um, you know, peer review uh, and then uh, action to, uh, to disallow leaders who sadly are not serving enough of their people, I think allows this type of um, you know, development like what we're discussing in Niger. OK, well, let me go back to Alex Vines in London, because there seems to be an opportunity here, Alex. You know, while uh, Niger is in flux uh, and Wagner and uh, Russia, as well as uh, the US and France, you know, vie for security supremacy in helping their African partners, there is a conference going on right now in St. Petersburg between Russia uh, and African nations. And I, and I can't help but think that they will be discussing this behind closed doors. Is this an opportunity for President Putin? Well, we'll see. Um, so I, re uh, I received a, a Twitter photo or X photo, as it's, it's called now, of Mr. Prashogin, you know, the, 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 the chief of Wagner, yeah. meeting a, a particular ambassador in St. Petersburg as part of a fringe meeting. And, and you know, putschists uh, leaders are, are invi invited in St. Petersburg. So, you know, you've got uh, 
the, the, the Burkina Faso and uh, and Mali represented there. The president of uh, of, of Guinea Bissau is there, and so on. Uh, and so clearly, the the, the Russians are always looking for opportunity. And Mr. Prishogin, um has has announced that he he will focus con continue to focus on Africa, and he's clearly doing that today in St. Petersburg. Now, whether the 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 the, the incoming military uh, putschists in 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 uh, Niamey uh, will reach out to Russia, um, let's see. But they'll certainly find that the Russians are knocking on their door. The Russians were knocking very loudly on the door of the the, the junta in Ouagadougou, the, the 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 Burkina Faso uh, junta. Uh, but up to now, the, 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 that junta has said no, thank you. We we don't want uh, Russia to be involved mm. with us. We are coming very closely to the end of our program. Nicholas Norbrook, just briefly, I mean, there is such a thing as civil society in, in most countries, and one assumes that there is such a society in uh, Niger too, who tried to support the president and, and faced gunfire. Where do you think the public stand now in Niger? And is there a voice or has it been silenced? Um, I, I don't think there is the size of middle class that you see in Sudan. And so you wouldn't get something akin to the resistance committees that have been so effective uh, in Sudan. Uh, but as you could see from the pictures yesterday, there were crowds who came out immediately in support of the president who are not keen on seeing their country being dragged down the direction of their neighbors. neighbors. Um, and while there may have been a few Russian flags seen in, in some of the crowds yesterday, um, we're relatively sure that that is opportunistic and doesn't uh, indicate some kind of groundswell. Um, it, it should be said that since February, um, Prigozhin's uh, LAFTA uh, mm. project, which is a big uh, uh, disinformation on social media projects run by uh, Prigozhin's uh, companies. Um, that has already been spreading since February uh, misinformation in, in Niger. Um, so this is something which is absolutely on the radar of, of Moscow. And I'd be very surprised if they weren't going to try and at least take advantage of, uh, of events. Indeed, it's a fast-moving story and one that is still developing even as we speak. I'd like to thank all of my guests uh, for joining me on this edition of Inside Story to Kabir Adamo, Nicholas Norbrook and Alex Vines. And thank you too as well for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com and for further discussion go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Now you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sahil Rahman, and the Inside Story team, thanks very much for your time and your company.